Well, after three hours of courtroom-style drama, is there a way back for Boris Johnson? We'll find out how many people here think he was telling the truth about Partygate. Is there a way back for him to frontline politics? Tonight, we are in Newcastle under Lyme. In 2019, this town next door to Stoke-on-Trent elected a Conservative MP, and that ended nearly a century of Labour dominance. We'll also be talking about can people ever regain trust in the police after that excoriating report this week? And what could be done to help people pay their ever-rising bills? Welcome to Question Time. panel this evening from the government. Andrew Bowie is in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. Indeed, he's the first ever nuclear minister, having been appointed last month. Prior to his election to the seat of West Aberdeenshire in Kincardine in 2017, he was an officer in the Royal Navy. When Louise Haig was elected as MP for Sheffield Healy in 2015, she was the youngest Labour member at only 27. Having spent time in her previous life as a volunteer police officer at the Met, she was made Shadow Policing Minister for three years. Now she is Shadow Transport Minister. Sing Seng moved here from Singapore as a teenager. She's now Editor-in-Chief of Vice UK, the digital media giant that calls itself the definitive guide to enlightening information. She also hosts a podcast and has written a series of books called Forgotten Women about women history has overlooked. Howard Davis is chairman of one of the UK's banking big four, the NatWest Group. His impressive list of former roles includes Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, Chair of the Financial Services Authority, and former Director of the London School of Economics. He's also the author of five books. And Tom Newton Dunn was political editor at The Sun for over a decade. He then worked for Times Radio before he moved into his current role as political presenter at Talk TV, where he counts Jeremy Kyle, Vanessa Feltz and Piers Morgan among his colleagues. Good evening from Newcastle under Lyme. Welcome to our panel. Welcome to our audience here. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. As always, we're on social media. We're also live on iPlayer at 8 o'clock. And then after the 10 o'clock news on BBC One, as always. Good to see you. Let's get the programme started with our first question from Jean Me. Hi. Is there any way, way back for Boris Johnson? Well, we saw a lot of Boris Johnson yesterday, didn't we? Jean, were you watching? I wasn't actually, no. I was <laughs> at a funeral, sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Andrew, is there any way back for Boris Johnson? <laughs> Look, I think uh, everybody uh, <laughs> was glued to their screens yesterday when the former Prime Minister uh, appeared in front of the Privileges Committee. It is a proper parliamentary process, and as a member of the government, it would be improper for me to comment on what is an ongoing procedure. Uh, we should let the... Uh, but that's not the question you're away. being asked. The question you're being asked is, is there any way back for Boris Johnson? I don't we certainly have an opinion on that. Well, I don't think there's any need for Boris Johnson to come back. I think in Rishi Sunak, we've got a very capable, competent Prime mm -hmm. Minister who's delivering for the British people and focusing on their priorities. And I think, frankly, uh, given all the drama that uh, this country has uh, gone through in the past few years, from COVID to the, uh, the, the, the disputes within the government, I think it's the British people are, are quite pleased to see somebody of Rishi's stature in number 10 governing in the national interest. So and you sound quite pleased that Boris Johnson may not be coming back then. I'm very pleased that Rishi Sunak is Prime Minister. <laughs> Make of that what you will. <laughs> Louise. Well, look, I mean, I think... I understand and feel myself that in the teeth of a cost of living crisis, with the highest inflation in the G7, a war in Ukraine, and the biggest fall in living standards for the second year running, that people feel pretty weary that we're talking about Boris Johnson again and that he is dominating the headlines. Um, but I think what the Privileges Committee is doing is important because it is examining whether he told the truth and whether he misled the House of Commons. And I think it's important that Parliament proves that it can uphold certain standards uh, in the House of Commons and that you, the British public, know that when you elect people to that place and to represent you on, on your behalf, um, that people speak the truth and can be held to account when they don't. And do you think Boris Johnson was speaking the truth yesterday? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, having watched Boris Johnson and uh, worked in the same place as him for many years, I feel it's difficult to know when he is telling the truth and when he isn't. Uh, I think his defence yesterday was um, incredible. 
Um, and I think we know for a fact that he broke the law. The Metropolitan Police have issued him a fixed penalty notice for it. Um, I think it's, it's quite incredible to believe that he didn't know he was doing that before he spoke to Parliament about it. Um, but, you know, for all his bluster and bluff, blaming Harriet Harman, Dominic Cummings, the Privileges Committee, describing it as a kangaroo court, I think if Boris Johnson wants to know why his integrity is in question, once again, in the full gaze of the British public, he doesn't need a well-paid team of lawyers, he just needs a mirror. Man, back there in the glasses. Uh, I struggle with the fact that the first speaker in this debate <coughs> didn't answer the question he was asked. Um, with the greatest respect, Minister, you were asked a very straightforward question and trolled out a party <laughs> line, which is nothing new. Uh, the Boris Johnson uh, hearing yesterday was disappointing, in my opinion, uh, in the history of this great country and our democracy. Um, and more and more, I find myself disappointed in the quality of the answers we receive from our politicians. I do believe that some of you are intelligent people, but I also well, only believe... Only some. Yeah, only some. <laughs> uh, but I also believe that more and more you take us for idiots and mugs. Um, and I would ask, in the run-up to a general election, that you all really consider the quality of the information you give to the voters. Um, and rather than just trolling out party lines, you address the real issues, especially that we face here in North Staffordshire, of families not being able to afford to live, communities torn apart by crime, an NHS in turmoil. So forget about how pleased you are that Richie Sunak's in office and start thinking about doing what you're there to do. All right. Please. Well, the, the gentleman there saying you didn't answer the question, I have to say I agree with him. Do you want to have another go? Is there any way back for Boris Johnson? It, that is the question. It's precisely because... Uh, we need to be focusing on the issues that you've raised, that I'm very pleased that Rishi is in government, still is not as answering Prime the question, Minister, Andrew. Is there any way back for Boris Johnson? the priorities Johnson? of the British people. That, that's a question that doesn't need to be asked, because we have... Well, a, hang on, a hang on. Wait, wait a minute. You're on question time. With, with the greatest respect, you're on question time. That is the question that was asked by Jean. Is there any way back for Boris Johnson? What do you think? <laughs> Look, I, I just think we should be focusing on delivering on the very things that you've spoken about. If we spend so much time focusing on the, the soap opera that, 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 is, that goes along with uh, privileged committee sessions like the one we saw yesterday, we distract ourselves as a government okay. from dealing with the problems in the NHS, from dealing with uh, inflation, from dealing with growing the economy, from stopping the boats and from getting uh, debt down. That's what this government is prioritising, not on the, the drama that's taking place on the sidelines. Let me just ask you, sir, do you feel that answered your question? Slightest. Right. And, okay. you know, don't no. talk to me about a soap opera. Boris Johnson was given almost quarter of a million pounds of public money to defend himself with the most expensive barrier, uh, barrister, sorry, in this country. So, you know, it's absolutely outrageous that people sitting in this audience, should they need legal aid, might not be able to secure it. But Boris Johnson, a multi-millionaire wastrel, is given a quarter of a million pounds to defend himself. It's a scandal. Can you come around some more of the audience? Commander in the yellow time. Hi, um, I'll answer the question for the Minister. Uh, is there a way back for Boris Johnson? The answer is no. Um, and I think we should draw a line under it and move on and deal with more serious issues as a country. Yeah. OK. <laughs> the man there in the yellow t shirt. Hi, yeah. Um, the question is, why has it taken this long to investigate the Portugate scandal, considering the timing of it and the seriousness of the allegations at a time when. Everyone else couldn't see their loved ones in hospital, um, dying, and yet they had this part in. But, yeah, it's taken, what, nearly two years later, something like that, to investigate the whole scandal allegations. It's just baffling. OK. Howard, let me ask you. So, Jean's question is, is there any way back with Boris Johnson? I mean, what did you make of, of well, Boris Johnson's evidence? this has become a sort of long-running show, like um, the mousetrap, really. And I think um, everybody in the country... Uh, who wanted to see it has now seen it, and we all know who done it. You know, it was Boris what done it, um, and so I think this should be over. I think we've done with this um, because you had a situation yesterday where the prime minister was putting through an important piece of legislation on the Northern Ireland bill, which seems to me to be important to sort of unblock a whole variety of issues in relation to Europe. He was doing a serious job. And all you had uh, was 
Boris Johnson occupying the airwaves with this amazing, ridiculous defence, um, and then voting against this deal which he initially said. I mean, this is not serious. We need some serious politicians. I think we've got one as Prime Minister at the moment. But, uh, you know, we shouldn't be distracted by this. Uh, this soap opera is a good way of putting it. I don't think it's a soap opera. I think it feels like a soap opera to some people. And, yes, there are definitely comedic, clownic elements to Boris Johnson's persona. But, I mean, really, like Louis said, this is about truth and trust in politics, right? It's about can you trust politicians in power? Do you believe them when they say you should be doing certain things? And when the next crisis comes along, will you follow what they say because you fundamentally believe they're telling the truth? And that's why I think the Privileges Committee is important, because finally Boris Johnson is being held to account. And if you look at the way he performed yesterday, I mean, he looked like a sullen schoolchild being hauled up towards the, in front of the Eton headmaster. He was irascible. He was grumpy. He was downright losing his temper at some points. It's the attitude of a man who's never been made to answer for anything in his life. And for once, he's finally being held accountable. And I think that to describe it as a soap opera and to say, let's draw a line, let's finish it, you know, we don't need to think about it anymore, I think that does a great disservice because there are so many people who spent the pandemic not being able to see their loved ones, having to say goodbye to them on Zoom, postponing weddings, graduations, memorials, funerals. Those people deserve to see someone being held accountable for the things that they said and didn't say during the pandemic. And I think, to be honest, this Privileges Committee is probably as good as it's going to get. OK. So, Tom, I mean, the question is, is there a way back for Boris Johnson? And Boris Johnson at one point was described as, you know, the Heineken politician. He reached parts others mm. couldn't reach. He got an 80 majority. He was twice elected as London mayor. And, and now we have him in front of this Privileges Select Committee. Is there a way back for him? So the thing about Boris Johnson is, I pretty every much pretty political journalist that exists have written him off. I think I personally written him off three times. Uh, then he became prime minister with an 80 seat majority. So, although I really don't think he's ever going to be prime minister ever again, I would never say never about anything in British politics. Although Boris Johnson because he has this weird way of bouncing back. That said, there was a really interesting poll uh, out this evening on whether the British public thought. Uh, that he had misled Parliament, which is why he's in front of the Privileges Committee. 66% said, yes, they think he did. And do you know what? The same question was asked on Monday. 66% said the same thing. It feels to me that the public have made up their mind on Boris Johnson. Tory MPs have made up their mind on Boris Johnson. Only 21 of them followed him through the division lobby on the big Brexit vote yesterday. Uh, back in the day, it was hundreds doing that. It's often said that red wall seats, which Newcastle under Lyme is, is technically one of them. You were a Labour seat, you've gone Tory now. His great support is here in the red wall. And you're the presenter, Fiona, but we could do a quick straw poll to see how many of the audience well, think Boris Johnson could well, come back. Well, let's, let's, let's just think about this for a minute. I mean, we can do a poll. It's not scientific. I want to emphasise that. There are more people in this audience, because this is where the question time audiences are constructed, if you like. There are more people in this audience who voted for Boris Johnson uh, for the Conservative Party than for any other single party here. So let's have a show of hands, shall we? Who... Well, who believes Boris Johnson was telling the truth yesterday? <laughs> wow. <laughs> OK. Wow. <clears throat> who believes there is a way back for Boris Johnson now? Right. One hand. So let, let's hear from you. He's like them saucepans, isn't he? Nothing sticks to him, so he's probably going to come back anyway. Isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Howard, it's interesting in terms of a unanimous vote here. As I say, it's not scientific. I don't want to overstate the importance of this, but it's pretty telling nonetheless, given the makeup of this audience, that no one believes he was telling the truth yesterday. Now, you had experience of working with Boris Johnson. Does, does that surprise yes, you? Yes, no, it doesn't surprise me, I'm afraid. I mean, I did, and uh, we had a d difficult uh, relationship, which I would acknowledge, because I was were doing some work on airports, and my conclusion, my commission that I chaired, was that we should expand Heathrow when further expansion was needed. And uh, Boris Johnson wanted an, an island in the Thames. This was Boris Island, if you remember. So we weren't going to agree. Uh, but that's one thing. We can disagree. Uh, but the alarming thing was that, you know, he, you would go and see him and tell him something, and then the next day you're listening to him on the radio, and he's telling the radio listeners that you told him something else, something completely different. It's quite alarming, actually, when it happens to you personally. So I do find it... Um, I mean, I, I think Cheng is absolutely right that this is serious and we need to know the, the answer to it. 
Uh, because it is rather it is rather concerning when it happens to you personally. I didn't like it one bit. OK, let me hear a bit more from our audience. Yes, the person over there, I can't see what cut up with the blonde hair. Um, I think... I think it's quite a shame we're still talking about Boris Johnson at this point because um, because Parliament isn't built on the on, on, on the banks of the Thames; it's built on the trust of the people. And with the amount Boris is being in the news for scandals, party gates, uh, the, the appointing the chairman of the BBC, um, people are not just losing faith in Boris or the Conservative Party, but losing faith in ministers in general. Like the fact that earlier we had someone laughing about a, a, a somewhat scripted response uh, from 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 Minister over there. It's, it's a shame that that's how it's gotten. Our politics is no longer a serious, serious topic which controls the, how this country is, is headed. It's become more of a joke in the eyes of too many people. OK. And man here in front in the, with purple tie, yes. Well, just a quick answer to the question, did I vote for Boris Johnson? No. I actually voted to keep Jeremy Corbyn out. And that's the only reason I voted for the Tory party. And the other quick thing to the gentleman there, I'm terrible with names. If you can't answer a question, there's a very simple answer in the North. Keep your gob shut. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to come back to that, Andy? Or would you just like to keep your gob shut? <laughs> Look, I mean, I completely understand the cynicism uh, and the despair uh, with uh, that people hold and with pe with which people look at politics in this country right now uh, and not least because of the 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 the, this, the the soap opera if you want to call it that that was going on uh, within parliament yesterday but you know in other parts of parliament there's a lot of serious work going on yesterday we passed the Windsor framework to deal with some of the issues regarding the Northern Ireland Protocol and develop our relationship, mature our relationship with the European Union. We passed the final elements of our trade deal with Australia and New Zealand yesterday. There were multiple committees sitting yesterday. One of them, Carol Vorderman, was in front of talking about the menopause and how shamefully women who've actually wanted to raise that yesterday have been treated. There was a lot of serious work going on yesterday. And that's the sort of thing we really should be focusing on because politics is a serious business. And we are, the vast majority of MPs are working hard on behalf of people around this country, bringing forward policies and coming up with solutions. Not all of them work but coming up with solutions to some of the issues that are being faced and for and, and I do think it's a distraction actually to be focusing on what was said in that privileges committee yesterday and whether or not Boris Johnson has a, a it could come back in some uh, way or form I stick to my original answer at the very beginning of this show there is no vacancy Rishi is doing a stellar job as prime minister and we're getting on focusing on the priorities of the British people which is what we are elected to do so why was the media talking about Boris Johnson all day? Well, I think that's a question for the media, not a question for those of us who were not focusing on what was going on in the committee. Because he's interesting. Yes, that's fair. And, and I would also say that we had a huge number of questions about it, which is why we're talking about it, first of all. Yeah. But I'm going to move on, because we had lots of questions about other things. I just want to say before I do that next week, Question Time is in Bristol. Uh, that's our last show for, or before the Easter break. We've got a couple of weeks off. And then we will be coming to York. So if you'd like to come to Bristol or to York after Easter. Go to the Question Time website, the address is here, and uh, you can see how to apply and come and be part of our audience. And who knows, even you could tell a government minister to keep his gob shut. I mean, or whatever else it might be. I mean, far, far be it from me. It's, first, it's the first. first for me on this programme. It's quite <laughs> rather first interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Not a first for you. Not first right, for okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, let's get a question. Let's get, let's get a question from Harry. Harry Ferns. There you are. Hi, yeah. Uh, my question is, what action is going to be taken to regain trust in police after this week a report found the Met to be institutionally racist, homophobic and misogynistic? I mean, the report by Baroness Casey was excoriating, I think it's fair to say. Um, Louise, mm. so not only were you shadow police mm. minister, but also you worked in the Met mm. for a couple of years. Mm. Were you surprised? Or did, by what Louise Casey had to say? Or did you think, yes, that pretty much tallies with what it was like when I was working so, there? So, um, I, I mean, as, as a woman, first and foremost, I, I was horrified by the report. I, it was genuinely frightening to read some of the examples that she mm. uncovered and reported on, the examples of officers who had committed appalling crimes and had remained in positions of power. Um, the examples of rape samples, of samples that were due to be used in rape trials, stuffed in overstuffed, dilapidated fridges that were allowed to degrade and then couldn't be used in those trials, so rapists walked free. That demonstrated the deprioritisation and the complete lack of interest, frankly, that the Met 
put in in uncovering and uh, convicting rapists in the way that they treated sexual offences. But as a former special constable, and I was I was a volunteer police officer in the run up to the Olympics in 2012. Was I, it for a couple of years, I think. Yeah, just less than three years. I um, I wasn't surprised at some of the culture and the attitudes that she found. I, on a fairly regular basis, would see pretty outdated and discriminatory attitudes expressed, which I would challenge and report up, but would go relatively unchecked. And to suggest that this is an issue that just is uniquely uh, applicable to the Met is certainly not true. I think this absolutely has to act as a wake-up call for British policing. You know, we're 24 years on from the McPherson report, which found that the Met was institutionally racist. For Baroness Casey to find, again, that the Met has not rid itself of institutional racism, and more than that, is institutionally homophobic and sexist as well, uh, is absolutely damning for British policing. And I believe in policing by consent in this country. That is the bedrock upon which policing is founded. And in order for that to survive and be successful, people have to have trust and faith in the police. So first and foremost, we've been calling for national standards to be applied across the whole of the country. At the moment, we've got patchwork vetting systems that allow, frankly, criminal officers to, um, to, to slip through the net and get into positions of power. Uh, we need to see national standards on vetting and training as well, and we need to see a proper focus on tackling violence against women and girls. I have to say, as a special constable, I worked against, you know, with some absolutely amazing officers that were shining examples of public service, uh, but we cannot allow this report to be a moment when British policing doesn't stand up and change and demonstrate that it's changed and changed permanently. And when you say you saw some outdated attitudes which you referred up and nothing was done, like what? Sexist attitudes. Um, so what kind of thing? So, um, oh, I remember being trained uh, at Hendon and being trained on um, equality and diversity policies, for example, and they were openly sneered at by the trainers themselves. Um, I remember sergeants expressing some pretty explicitly sexist and discriminatory comments and I would complain to their seniors and nothing would be done about it. I'd say that would be the, that would be the experience of a majority of officers, uh, female officers in policing. Um, Howard, one of the things that, that, that struck me reading the report was how, how systemic, how endemic this problem mm. appeared to be in the Met. And, and I, I guess we'd be foolish to think it is only the Met. Mm -hmm. Um, and we know there are, I mean, the police force here in Staffordshire is in special measures, for example. There's a number of complaints out against Staffordshire. It, it, clearly, there needs to be a culture change in the Met, as well as other things yeah. that, that the government might do. I'm just wondering, from your experience of running the, the huge companies that you have, how easy is it to actually do that? Well, it's not, it's not easy. In fact, uh, in a, a bit of my lengthy uh, CV you didn't read out, I was at one point the <laughs> auditor of... All the police forces in England, actually, uh, from a, not just from a financial point of view, but also from a kind of efficiency and management point of view, except the Met. And this is the point I think is important, is that the Met uniquely in this country reports to two masters, uh, one to the uh, mayor, but also to the home office. And that's because the Met does things which are the, in the nature of national policing. So it does anti-terrorism, it does diplomatic protection, all of those rather hard-edged things which we actually want a tough police force to do. But, of course, it's also the police force for the ordinary people of London, community policing and everything else. And in my view, that does not work. Mm. It does not work in many other countries. Most countries have those two things quite separate. You have the FBI and the... US, which is quite separate from the policing of, of New York, for example. In France, you have police force reporting nationally to the, to the Ministry of the Interior, but you have local community, you know, Paris city police, if you like. And I think we, when you've got something reporting to two different people, that's effectively you're reporting to nobody. Uh, and, you know, we saw the previous arguments about who should be the boss and the mayor wanted to keep her on and the Home Secretary didn't and then it was the other way around. It was hopeless. So I really do think that whilst I completely accept that structural change is not always the answer, I think it would be a real shock to the Met if they were broken up.
and I think it can be done. There are plenty of international models how it would be done, and that possibly could be the shock that delivered cultural change uh, as well. I think without anything else, I think the Met must be sort of saying now, you know, we're another of these bloody reports, they'll forget about this one like they did the last. And unless something happens as a result of it, I think we'll have these problems coming back. OK, let me hear a bit from Lawrence. The woman here <coughs> with the green and black top and the long blonde hair. So I've been a serving police officer for 17 years in Staffordshire. Um, right, so you're a police officer. I am, yeah, So we're very Staffordshire. interested to hear from you. Yeah. Thankfully, I've personally never witnessed any any behaviour in the force that I serve in. I've never been subject to anything like that myself, thankfully. But we, we, we're we not invested in. It's like mm. we've forgotten about. I can't begin to tell you what what a state the, the police is in. We, we we can't cope with demand. We're on we're on our knees and we you know we don't have the the we're not in a position to go and strike like other public sector workers. What what are the, what are the government doing it about policing? We we've just forgotten about. Well, listen, I, I will come to the government, but if I can just, since we've got you here, just ask you a little bit more if that's all right. I mean, what what did you think of? of the report by Baroness Casey? I mean, did it, did it surprise you? Is it, is it something that you, if, even if you have an experience, you, you feel is possibly true of your own force or, or, or not? I'm not so, you know, blind as to think that these kind of things don't go on. We'd be foolish not to think that they do. And it's, it's toe-curling. It's, it's, it, it's heart-wrenching to think that, you know, for, for, for the vast majority of police officers that are out there, they're, they're decent, hard-working people that join the service. They, they, they want, that's what they want to do. They want to serve the public. And, and we, f we can't. Our hands are tied. I don't think, I don't think ministers know what, what an actual state we are in. It, and that was what Baroness Casey found as well, that London didn't have a functioning model of neighbourhood policing anymore. It had been cut back so significantly that there essentially wasn't any neighbourhood policing. There is no neighbourhood policing. Yeah. There is no neighbourhood policing. You can say there's neighbourhood policing, yeah. but when but when there's when there's calls coming in that we the police can't months. resource, yeah. there's nine 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 calls stacking up. Mm -hmm. There's no neighbourhood cops. Then neighbourhood cops are being sent to them jobs. Yeah. Yeah. There's hundreds of there's hundreds of incidents every day that we don't get to. We have time parameters of when we're supposed to get to them. They sat there for two three weeks sometimes. Yeah, it's soul destroying. Andrew. Yeah. To address the report first, and then to the specific points about the police, I think none of us reading. Uh, uh, Baroness Casey's report yesterday were anything other than shocked. Uh, I think some of the systemic uh, failures uh, within the Met Police, failures in culture, failures in uh, best practice... Uh, were... Institutional? Would you use that word? Because that's the word that Baroness Casey uses. Baroness Casey did use that. Um, it was a full report and, you know, we need to take our time as a government to uh, fully uh, develop a full and proper response. Do you endorse that word? Minister, the, the Prime Minister has already taken action. Uh, to so let me just, just be clear that the word institutionally racist, homophobic, misogynistic. Do you do you back that? It, it is really important, given the thorough nature of that report, that we take time to completely uh, take stock, uh, come up with a proper response, and that work that we can do in the immediate is done, such as changing the vetting procedures. Okay, because I noticed that the Home Secretary country. has not endorsed that word, neither has the head of the Met, and I'm taking it that you aren't, aren't either. The question is, On what the... action will be taken? So what action is the government going to take? Well, as I said, we're already changing uh, the vetting procedures for recruiting new officers across the, the, the country. It's really important that within the Met, uh, it, 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 particularly, there, there is a change of culture. I think that is, you know, a discussion to be had between the Home Office, the Mayor of London, and the Met Commissioner. I know how seriously all three of those individuals take the report and I know that they'll be taking forward responses to that uh, in the immediate future. Regarding functioning and, and, and um, support and financing uh, of policing uh, across the country, you know, there were decisions taken uh, between 2010 uh, and uh, 2015 as a result of the financial crisis that did see police numbers drop in this country, that's accepted. Uh, that is why, in the in the past few years, we've recruited 20,000 new police officers, 300 more in Staffordshire here. I know that people fear we could do more, and we need to have more of a presence of neighbourhood policing uh, on the streets to make people feel safe. It should be noted that uh, crime has gone down by 50% across the country. That's not actually uh, in any small part down to, down to the huge work that you and your colleagues have been doing. And I think before uh, you move on, Fiona, I think we should pay tribute to the vast majority of police officers who go to work uh, day in, day out, uh, to protect people in this country uh, in the very best traditions of the police service. 
Uh, um, that is not in any way taking away from the report. There is certainly actions that need to be taken, but we should also pay tribute to those men and women uh, who go out in uniform uh, with the country's best interests at heart uh, day in and day out. And just when you're, you're, you're selecting that particular statistic of a 5% of a, of a drop, what are you talking about? What, what period is 50 it drop. 50% drop. 50% drop. What is that covering? Uh, from 2010 to 2023, there's been a 50% drop uh, in reported crime across the country, 40% drop in uh, violent crime. You know, the, the, these are statistics. Only if you take out fraud. Because recorded it, crime yeah. in England and Wales hit a 20-year high yes. in 2022. You're taking out fraud, which yeah. I, I seem to remember the former Charles of Quasi Quarteng also did. Fraud is clearly a crime as well. Yeah, fraud is, is clearly uh, a crime. But the fact is that, as I said, reported so, crime is down 50%, violent crime down no, 40%. If you exclude fraud. And we are, and fraud, and we are employing 20,000 more police officers across the United Kingdom as we speak. And clear-up and, rates are at record lows. <coughs> Prosecution rates are down to 5% of all recorded crimes. And what really is the point of recruiting more officers if you're still going to let people with violent past, people who are prone to abuse, slip through the net? And what are you doing to actually weed out people like that from the force who are currently serving? Well, these are, these are the changes to the vetting procedures. <laughs> these, are, these are the changes to the vetting procedures that, that, that the Prime Minister has already begun work on implementing across the country. It's essential that people uh, that we have seen in the very recent past uh, serving within the Met Police and other police forces across the country who should not have been put in the position of trust and authority that they were, wearing that uniform that so many wear with pride and do so well. Th these people should not be allowed to find their way into those ranks and these are the changes that are being enacted as we speak. Seeing I'm going to come back to you, I hear a bit more from our audience and I'd like to hear from you as well. Yes, um, the woman back there with the glasses, you see, in, in, uh, yes, there you are. Yes, we do have some great police officers, but... And, and I accept the report and I accept that the, the, the something should have happened on the original report 20, 30 years ago. My key issue was that what are you doing when things go wrong? What are the police force doing when things go wrong? They're self-regulating and I really do not have any faith in their self-regulation. Um, can we not see some form of better regulation of the police when things go wrong and when they themselves are accused of criminal um, deeds? All right. Yes, the one further back, also with glasses. Examples start at the top, which is government. You've got Dominic Raab under investigation for bad behaviour in his role. For bullying. How many... Conservative ministers have had to resign within the last 12 months or 24 months because of their behaviour. It starts at the top. How can you expect other public services to act properly when government aren't setting good examples? OK, I'll, I'll let you come back on that, but let me get round the rest of the panel. I, think. I mean, this, this is what it all comes down to, right? And, you know, the previous person said, what are people doing to... How can people regain trust in policing? And your question also relates to trust, right? How can you trust the government is behaving in ways that set an example for institutions like the Met Police? And the sad answer is that, in many ways, people in government, those in power, get away with far too much. In many ways, the Met Police were allowed to get away with terrible things. We go back to that question about, you know, are they able to self-regulate themselves? No, they're not. I mean, you just need to look at the police force that David Carrick was part of, right? When David Carrick was hauled up and arrested and charged with rape, he was still a serving police officer, and they just let him continue being part of the force. If you were part of any other company, the police came knocking on your door to charge you with a sexual crime, you can bet your bottom dollar that your company would say goodbye. Why should the police be any different? Tom. So to, to the excellent point, you know, who is looking at these people? Where is the regulation? There's a really simple answer. It's called the politicians who we elect to police our police force. Mm -hmm. And Sadiq Khan has been London mayor for six years, throughout which we've known how bad the Met has been. If we just concentrate on the Met here, Staffordshire Police, uh, I know less about but have nothing wrong about at all. The, the, well, government... the Staffordshire Police are in special measures. Uh, in, in which case, I've just learned something. There you go. Uh, the government has been in, in charge for 13 years and they have known ab about the problems in the Met. The Met's problems go back to the McPherson report 24 years ago. And I, I tell you, the, the most disturbing thing I heard all week uh, about this in light of the, the, the Casey inquiry, it was something that Theresa May, former Home Secretary and Prime Minister, uh, said to a couple of Conservative MPs uh, in the House of Parliament earlier this week when they asked her, well, 
why didn't you reform the Met? You knew how bad it was when you were Home Secretary. Uh, and she said, listen, I'm just reporting what they said to me. It wasn't a battle I could win. What she said was the Met are so big, so powerful, so big in their briefing with journalists and everybody else. If we in the Cameron government took them on and tried to form them, uh, they'd have killed us. Now, that to me makes me completely agree with Howard. When you have an organisation that is too big, too powerful to be taken on by a government, by a home secretary, it's time for them to be split up. You hive off the specialist measures, the national measures, the counter-terrorism, the firearms to a national force that can be properly scrutinised, and you let London police get on with policing London and going back to service, which seems to be a word that's completely disappeared from their vocabulary. OK. Andrew, I'm going to let you come back to the, the woman back there. And also, in terms of... The question is what action will be taken. You're, you're saying, well, we're taking the action already. Is that it? No, 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 no. We're, we're taking action... Uh, we were taking action before the report was published uh, to resolve vetting and some other issues. You can do anything issues. else? Uh, the, the, the Home Office and the government as a whole are considering this report, and that is absolutely okay. right and proper. It is a full report. There are a lot of recommendations in there. It is right that the government takes time to come to a conclusion and to come up with a, a full response uh, in due course. Uh, to respond to the lady's uh, point, I mean... When uh, ministers, members of parliament are accused of wrongdoing, as far too many have been, uh, uh, I would agree, uh, in recent years, uh, the practices to withdraw the whip, there's an independent investigation into that wrongdoing, and if they're found uh, to have committed a crime uh, in a court of law, they are subject to a recall petition, and they could be stripped of their job and they could be replaced as MPs. And that has, taken, that has happened, actually, uh, two or three times in this parliament alone. That is the right course of action to take. And it is absolutely, as Tom said, in terms of the police, we do have elected police and crime commissioners across England and Wales. They're the ones who are supposed to be responsible for upholding the regulations and, and ensuring that the police are answerable to the people that they are serving. And in London, it was Sadiq Khan, who has been uh, mayor of London and police and crime commissioner for an incredibly long time now, when all of this uh, was going on. So really, he needs to take a good hard look at himself. Indeed, he needs to be looking at the report and deciding what actions he's going to take on the back of that as we move forward. Presumably, it's harder to look at himself as the government is having a look at itself, given the government's been in power for 13 years. Yes, but we are, we, are, we, we are taking this report, we are coming to conclusions, and we will decide what to do in due course. I very okay. much hope that Sadiq Khan, I very much hope that Sadiq Khan, as the Police and doing Crime the Commissioner of London, is doing exactly the same. OK, I'm going to take another question from Dwayne Barrett. Hi. Um, with inflation rising once again, in order when people continue to be unable to, to feed themselves, how do we get people's costs down? Which is something I expect a lot of people are, are, are wondering. And, of course, we had the Bank of England announcing a rise uh, in interest rates again today, now to 4.25%. Howard? Well, I'm afraid that um, there probably isn't a huge amount can be done in the short term, except what the government, of course, have done uh, correctly on energy prices, which has been to... that's been helpful. Uh, I fear we have to support uh, the bank <coughs> in their efforts to get inflation down, because we won't get inflation down unless... Uh, we have interest rates at a, at a higher level and we sort of dampen down uh, borrowing and dampen down demand because uh, ultimately inflation is about an imbalance of supply and demand and I'm afraid that's what we've got. Uh, so I think that is going to take a little bit of time. But and, Howard, when it if, comes to food prices, for yeah. example, which has been one of the things that's driven this unexpected uh, spike in, in inflation, are people just supposed to wait put up with it? There's nothing that, that, that can be done? You just have to wait no. for inflation eventually to come down? No, people obviously have to, uh, will have to rebalance their spending to some extent. Now, admittedly, for people on very low incomes, that is very difficult because food is a large proportion of their budgets uh, and therefore the benefit system will have to take the strain for the people on the lowest incomes. So there's, no, there's no two ways about that. Um, but... Uh, for other people, I'm afraid, it, you know, there will be a squeeze on discretionary spending. That's what it, it, that's what it means, having inflation running at 10.4% and wages increasing on average at about 6%. And pensions, of course, increasing rather less in the private sector, though the state pension's going up by a bit more. So there will be a living standard squeeze, and I fear a worse one than other countries uh, are facing. Uh, and that part of that is to do with the sort of political turmoil... Uh, we've had and the pound falling post-Brexit and a whole variety of issues have got us into a worse box than other people. But I'm afraid it's going to be a painful year and I think anyone who tells you it's not uh, is not telling you the truth. 
I mean, I think the key thing here is that if you put aside all the kind of financial jargon and percentages and things like that, what you're actually saying is that the cost of everything is outstripping people's everyday wages, right? Things are more expensive in shops. Your paycheck doesn't cover the cost of living. And that's not just because of what's happening in Ukraine or Russia or, you know, the Federal Reserve or interest rates going up. It's because wages have stagnated for years. You know, since 2008, people in the UK have been worse off by £11,000 a year. And that isn't going to change anytime soon. And for the longest time, you know, we talk about a, reset, a potential recession, a crisis. For the longest time, there have been families in the UK who have been in crisis for years because a decade or so of austerity, of cuts to social services, of cuts to welfare have meant that they've already had to make really tough choices about the kind of food they can put on the table and about their quality of life. So when you have even the government's own agency, the OBR, saying that we're going to experience the biggest drop in living standards since the 1950s, even after the budget comes out, I mean, that to me tells you that the problem is about as intractable as it comes. You know, it's not just about the current political climate. It's also about economics and it, also, it is also about political decisions that were made years and years ago. Okay. There's a lot of hands up. Let's hear from some of you. So the woman there in the black top. Yes. Yes, you. Um, you've got the government telling us, to, us NHS workers to accept this pay offer. And yet we're hearing about the I cost th of it. And I think your being... union suggested that you accept it. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but how, how, how are we supposed to survive? On when you've got this going on. Um, we've got nurses going to food banks. I've got people that are at the top end of the wages um, that are saying they can't survive on the pay offer. People at the lowest are also squeezed as well. Um, we're told that we go to university, we work our way up and you'll get rewarded, but it's just not happening. So how, how do we survive? And, and what, what changes have you had to make with, with the... With um, I've had to swap to cheaper, cheaper supermarkets. I have to travel to a community store. Um, and that takes about an hour and 45 minutes to go there and back. Um, I've had to go second-hand shops. We're, we're terrified the rent's going to go up. Um, I'm paying extra for fuel to go see people. Um, my husband... Very good job. He's absolutely terrified of anything else going up. Every month he's asking for more and more. I just haven't got it. And can I ask you, what do you do in the NHS? Um, I work in the community right. with patients. OK, well, thank you. Yes, the woman there with the red hair and the black glasses. I run a local charity in the area and I see firsthand people that come to use my food bank and my social supermarket. You spoke about discretionary spending. There are many, many people that do not have discretionary money to pull back on. There's nothing more that they can pull back on other than food. That's the only thing. We supply emergency food parcels. Last year, an emergency food parcel for four days was costing us, we bought it from the supermarkets, £7.80. That now costs us £14. It has nearly doubled. People cannot pull back on anything. There is nothing to pull back on. So the fact that inflation is raised again, what are people supposed to do? It's a joke. OK. And the woman... Uh, yes, a bit, bit further along with the... Yes, with the, the pink scarf and the... Me? Yes. Uh, I just want to kind of say that, obviously, people can't afford to save any more. They are, like this lady's just said, already kind of... On, you know, got no money left before, and also how the, that's going to impact on people's long-term health, and how we're going to need more health services because they haven't been eating right and haven't had a good standard of life. So, you know, we're not doing the future any good now by not giving people the resources they need to eat properly. So, what would you like to see the government do? I would like them to give people more food vouchers. I don't think necessarily need the money. They need the food vouchers because that's a really important thing that people have, a good diet. So give people that money to help them. You know, those people, like that lady said, have already got nothing. So they need something now. You know, they've got nothing to crawl back on. They were already doing that before. I would also add to that rent freezes. You know, yeah. if not a rent freeze, 
make it harder for landlords to pass on the increasing cost of their mortgage repayments onto their tenants. You know, there needs to be tighter regulation of the housing market so people don't live in fear of being evicted if the rent suddenly goes up by 150 percent, which is what's you know currently happening in places like London. So if you just took away the amount of rent that people had to pay out of their paycheck, that would go quite a long way towards covering the rest of the month. Your point about the cost of food, I think, is absolutely spot on. It's horrific. So the inflation figures yesterday, tragically, were on the way back up now, up 10.1 to 10.4% yesterday. That's a worry for everybody. Food was the single biggest gainer, 18% up year on year. A jar of Nescafe instant coffee costs eight quid now. It is terrifying. How, what do we do about it all? So it's a global problem. We know why the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, the knockoff from COVID, etc. But I do think we have to be honest and say we've got a particular problem with costs, inflation in the UK. We're at 10.4% now. Europe's about 8.5%. The US down to 6%. They're both dropping. So you know, what is so bad about us? And I think there's a number of uh, answers, which I won't give you an economist essay on, but in, very briefly. Uh, we've got a particular supply chain bottleneck because we're in Ireland. We pay a massive amount of tax, 37.7% of GDP now is our tax burden, the highest since the Second World War. Getting people's tax down could help. But let's open the Brexit can just a tiny bit, shall we? Brexit has not worked yet. If we got Brexit to work a little bit better, we could get food in cheaper and then costs of food would go down a little bit. OK. Andrew. Yeah, I think... Look, you're hearing... I don't want to oversee it, but you're hearing some real despair, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. From, from people in the audience. Yes. You had some ideas. You mentioned food vouchers. You talked about rent freezes. The question is, what can be done? Uh, yes, there is real despair out there. And don't just hear it in this room. I hear it in constituency surgeries in my own uh, constituency in West Aberdeen, Shrink and Carden. Nobody can fail uh, to notice, and absolutely nobody, no matter... Uh, how much they are earning has been unaffected by inflation and the huge increase in energy prices and indeed in food prices. I mean, this, this, this all goes to the heart of the matter as to why having inflation and getting inflation down is so critically important and a, a critically important mission uh, for this government. All in the meantime, all what are people supposed to do? I mean, the, the government has taken huge steps to support people paying half of everybody's energy bills uh, through the winter, plus £90 billion pounds committed in the last budget to support people who are really struggling uh, in this country. The, 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 the problem with food, it all comes back to the cost of production. And Tom's absolutely right. We, do, we are in a unique circumstance uh, as an island. We import a lot of our food uh, into this country. We need to drive down the cost of production. That means getting energy Brexit prices, as well. getting energy prices uh, heading south. I do think that we need to make uh, Brexit work. Uh, for the United Kingdom. I do think we need to do what we can to, to smooth the import-export journey into this country. In fact, this government is developing uh, plans right now to do uh, just that. But, you know, in the immediate, I, 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 I hear these concerns back home. I hear these concerns across the country. I hear them uh, tonight. I'm very pleased that we committed £90 billion pounds to support people. I'm very pleased that we're extending the energy price guarantee uh, through to July. I, the OBR forecast is that inflation will uh, will come down incredibly quickly as we proceed through the year. I really hope that is the case okay. and energy bills are forecast to come down as well. All of that will go towards supporting people in this country who I, who I know are, are, are suffering at the minute. Louise, the question is how do we get people's costs down? We all know what all the problem mm. is, everyone's experiencing it. How do we get people's costs down? Well, um, I just let me just say, just at the start, I, you know, I think about a couple of people that I've helped this week and the point the lady there makes about the shadow that poverty can cast over an entire lifetime and the impact that it has on your health, your life expectancy for your entire life. I thought about that very keenly this week when I was helping um, a, a, a little boy who had um, alerted his head teacher that he had not had a bath in three weeks because his family couldn't afford to dry the towels, couldn't get the, couldn't get the towels dried in his house because they couldn't pay their energy bills. I was helping another woman who was potentially made homeless because she, was, she couldn't afford her rent anymore. She was, she was being evicted from her private tenancy and we managed to get into a council house. But these are stories that are being told and being experienced right across the country at such an extreme level at the moment. And as has rightly been said, there are global factors. Uh, there is the war in Ukraine and there is the long shadow of COVID. But there are also explicit British factors here 
not least the fact that the Tory government last year consciously crashed the economy by attempting to force through tax cuts for the very rich. And Zing's absolutely right. The situation we find ourselves in now does come down to political choices. And last week, the government had a chance to push through a budget that would have provided more support to people at the moment. We're very glad they extended the energy price freeze. We've been calling for that well ahead of them introducing it in the first place. But they also chose to introduce a tax cut for the top 1% of earners in this country. No. That's the choice that they chose to make. They're not learning from their mistakes at all. We've set out very different choices. We've so what, 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 what are they? So the question is, how do we get yeah. those costs down? So yeah. what would Labour do? Well, we would, I mean, obviously a very important point is, is the um, price freeze at the moment. Tom's absolutely right. We need to go from getting Brexit done to making Brexit work. So we need to reduce some of the barriers to trade in order to um, improve the supply chain bottlenecks. That's really important. We would increase the minimum wage to a real living wage that genuinely reflects the cost of living. And my colleague Bridget Philipson has been campaigning for some da time to abolish the non-DOM tax status in order to provide free breakfast clubs for every primary school child because it is an absolute disgrace that children are going hungry to learn at the moment. I'm going to take one last question. Forgive me, because I know there's lots of hands up, but a lot of you asked about this other question as well, so I'm just, I'm just going to try and squeeze it in before the programme closes. It's from Jermaine. Jermaine Lennon. Um, so, with the United Nations warning again that, that this is our last chance to save the planet, are we doing enough? So, the United Nations warning again, as you say, Jermaine, this is our last chance to save the planet. I mean, the IPC, the, the UN body, said in the very near term, global warming is more likely than not to reach 1.5 degrees centigrade, and they are calling for net zero plans to be brought forward by a decade to 2040. Are the, in the UK, uh, for example, is currently 2050. Are we doing enough? Zing. No, we're absolutely not doing enough. Um, and I think what's really heartening, actually, about the IPCC report is that, yes, it acknowledges that we have enormous cause for alarm, but also that we have the tools and the technology already in hand to arrest climate catastrophe. And it makes a very deliberate choice to reject the kind of pessimism that I think hearing headlines like this makes us all feel, to try and empower people to say, actually, no, we have a real shot at changing things. You know, renewable energy is already nine times cheaper than gas. Why are we still relying on gas when we could just switch to renewable energy? And I think when it comes to questions of net zero, are we going to hit that by 2050? Not with this current government, we're not, because we only have a third of the policies in place right now that we need to hit net zero. One of the things about the IPCC report as well is that it stresses this idea of climate justice, right? That it's not fair that places like the UK were able to industrialise and develop incredibly quickly by burning fuel, by polluting the oceans and waters, by chopping down trees, and now it's less developed countries in the global south that now have to pick up the tab. So part of this idea of climate justice is that we as the UK have a moral responsibility and an imperative and also an opportunity to be a global leader and try and hit net zero faster. So I, you know, really love to hear from Andrew, for instance, what we're doing to kind of bring the target forward, because, frankly, 2050 is far too far away. So as the minister in the department for net yep. zero, and you're the nuclear minister, yep. uh, do you agree with this uh, recommendation by the UN that we bring the target for net zero closer to 2040? Uh, I agree that the world should be moving faster and investing more in clean and green technologies. In fact, they should be following the UK's lead. We were the first country in Europe to legislate for net zero. Some of the incredible technologies that are coming on stream that I see on a daily basis will be transformative in That's terms not of our the carbon uh, Do you think emissions. we should go for 2040? I think 2050 is not really that far away. Yeah, but do you and think if we should we go 2040? Go that's what I'm asking. That's what the UN is suggesting. Faster, do you think we should do that? We already have the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth <laughs> biggest wind farms in the world off the coast of this country. Have, have, have I missed the answer? Carbon emissions. <laughs> We've reduced our carbon emissions faster than any other G7 nation. Okay, we I'm going to have one more go. The UN is suggesting that all countries should bring forward their net zero plans to 2040. Do you think the UK should do that? If we can go further and faster than we should, but we are already going incredibly fast and leading the world right now, and I wish other countries would keep pace with us. So are we doing enough? That's the other question that Jermaine's asking. Are we doing enough in this country? Absolutely, and there's more to come. OK. <laughs> uh, I suppose there's a few... Yeah, not everyone agrees with that, Andrew. I think Louise, possibly you don't. 
Um, well, um, not only uh, are we not doing enough, the Conservatives' strategy to meet our binding climate change targets, which were introduced the by a climate change, um, by climate change act in 2008 by the last Labour government, have been, has been found to be unlawful. Was Just 28% of your emissions cuts are backed by firm government targets. In my area of, of transport, for example, the government has a plan, uh, a target, to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. There is absolutely no way we are going to meet that target with the programme that we are making at the moment. There are more public charging points in one in the one borough of Westminster than there are a, amongst the 11 biggest towns and cities in the north of England. The disparity of access to be able to move to an electric vehicle is so enormous, it's so out of reach for so many people. And in areas like the West Midlands where our automotive industry is the jewel in our crown of our manufacturing sector, the government is doing nowhere near enough to support that manufacturing sector to move to um, EV transition as well. That's why JLR is um, thinking about moving uh, its gigafactory plans to Spain. It's why BMW were talking about moving the electric mini production overseas as well. So the government needs to be doing much more to help consumers, but also to help industry because, as Zing says, it's also an, a massive opportunity. Some country will win the race for these green well-paid, well high-skilled jobs of the future, and there's absolutely no reason it shouldn't be Britain. It's going to be Britain. Howard, yeah. are we doing enough? Uh, no. Um, uh, the government's rhetoric is quite Because cool. Andrew thinks the government's doing but, absolutely fine uh, and No, dandy. he doesn't. He says they're doing enough but should do more. I'll, um, we need to discuss that, uh, quite okay, so whether that means anything. But, um, I mean, I think the government's rhetoric is OK, but actually, if you look at what goes on, it's a very confused messaging. Because on the one hand, you have commitments to phase out sale of cars by 2030, but no progress actually to doing it. Uh, you have good talk about more renewables, but not enough uh, investment. We have talk about nuclear, but the approvals for nuclear plants, even small ones, seem to be interminable. The government then freezes uh, duty on, on fuel oils. I mean, what, you know, how, do we, how do we reconcile that with the policy? And then the government cuts air passenger duty. Uh, which will save a lot of money for Premier League football clubs flying their players for 20 minutes around the country, as far as I can see. So the messaging is all wrong and we are confused and we do not have a national strategy. And it's frustrating in the business community because, actually, I don't think there is that much difference between Labour and Conservatives. I mean, they'll say there is, but I don't think fundamentally there is and, therefore, it would, should be possible to have a national strategy. Tom. No, we're not doing enough, obviously, because the IPCC is pretty good at these things, for some pretty good scientists, and they say we're, we're heading for serious trouble. Uh, I just slightly caveat all my fine panel members' points on here. Of course we need to do more, but let's be honest, there is huge cost in doing more. We're just talking about the cost of living. It means putting up taxes. Andrew won't tell you that, but that's true. I doubt Lou will tell you that either, and Singh didn't want to touch on that. <laughs> uh, of course we should do all that. The problem we've got here is a political trap, because... The long term, the solutions here are long term. Political cycles, electoral cycles are short term. This government wants to get re-elected in about 18 months' time. Lou and, and the Labour Party want to get in. I don't hear either of them say they're willing to pay for what we need to do mm. to get to net zero by, say, 2040. OK. I, I'm afraid we are out of time. This is far too important a subject to only spend 10 minutes on, so forgive me. We ran out of time. There were so many questions we wanted to get through. Our hour is up. Uh, thank you very much to all of you on the panel. Thank you all of you very much for coming along, Newcastle Under Lime. And, of course, thank you for watching Question Time. From Newcastle Under Lime, until next week, bye-bye. <laughs>